Yeah, and it, it, for me, I it kind of was interested because obviously the governor uh, vetoed uh, having the, the WSSAC over um, thing, and I know Patrick, Oversight, Patrick's, yeah. Patrick's running for governor, so you never know. Oh, uh, do you plan on bringing that oversight bill back this uh, upcoming year? I sure year? do, absolutely, as well as a number of other bills I got sent to my desk Monday. I wish you guys would have overridden his veto on that one. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about your time at the uh, interim session in Charleston, and specifically you're on the education committee, and you sit on rules as well, which is a fascinating yeah, one. Yeah. Um, I think uh, this time around, education met, economic development met. Uh, there was a very – it was very geared toward aviation, um, both in education and in economic development. I think you're going to see – a lot of legislation, maybe some appropriations for airports, regional airports. We, the, I think West Virginia is trying to be the leader in educating in, in aviation, whether it's building planes, fixing planes, flying planes, you know, those kind of Flight things. Flight school? Flight schools. There's um, Marshall has a very dynamic program, and they, they, they've paired up with Pierpont, with uh, uh, Huntington, uh, Huntington, Fairmont, you know, it's a very small geographical state, so it makes it very easy for regional airports. Um, so those bills think, should just take off. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, there was a lot of that going on down there. <laughs> but yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of legislation come out of that, um, whether it's from the governor's office or from leadership. I just have a feeling when you start seeing at interims the direction of where the meetings are going, uh, I think you're going to see some some more stuff come out of, of that. From so I was I was impressed with that. Mac Warner was on the show yesterday, and if if he's governor, part of his his campaign is all about improving education, mm-hmm. and he had a long list of of things that he wants to do with education. How much power in West Virginia does a governor have to have any impact on on I mean, education? He, he's he's the number one guy, so I mean, he's the one that puts a budget together to start with, and then the legislative body can we can we can adjust it, but. The governor has a lot of power to change that. Um, now, how he does it or what he focuses on, that's up to him. So I, I do think education, it, I think education is going to be a huge priority this this bill. I think uh, I've heard we're, we're, we're going to try and do uh, some things for the teachers. Uh, I know I've got a bill studying the school aid formula uh, and, and going, you know, rewriting it from scratch uh, because it is out, so outdated. Um, I also have a bill auditing all the BOEs um, and doing a full audit because of what happened down in Upshur County. During a four-year term, how many appointments to the State Board of Education does a governor get? Is it one per year? I believe he gets all of them. No, they serve uh, nine-year terms. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know how that staggers up, but he, he gets to choose wh- whichever ones come up. Okay. Yeah. I, I got your question. It was kind of like, what's the stagger on it? Yeah, yeah what's the stagger on it? And what, I don't know What the is stagger. the string that a governor can pull? If, if this Jackie is kind of Long an ossified is, system here. If Jackie's so. listening, I know Jackie probably knows the answer Yeah, to she kind of, so. she worked a lot on the state board BOE. But I know it's staggered, but the, the governor gets to choose each one. So I, I presume it's probably four in a four-year term. It could be more. Yeah, okay. if it's yeah. nine-year terms. I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if they stagger two at a time yeah, I have no, I which have is no something I, I i think it's a constitutional issue but that's that's a form of madness to have yeah. education system run by political appointees that have nine-year terms yeah. i mean that's just and, and we try to do that with amendment two and you know berkeley jefferson i think jefferson was also uh, for it but berkeley was for it we were one of it the other, failed oh, and well, failed miserably across the state. Well, it failed, it failed in Jer- Jefferson. Okay. It was, just, it was yeah. close, though. But Berkeley was. I think the, the the nine year term justification is to keep one governor from being able to appoint all of them at the all, same time. All yeah. of them, yeah. You got but nine. You got four year terms in the governor's mansion, so a five year term would prevent that from happening. You know, five, not if, five year. Not if the, they win. Their re-election. Well, that's where elections eight, have consequences. And con- eight eight years. constitutionally, I think it's in the Constitution that way. So that, that's why right. we had to have the referendum. That's why somebody can't just come in and write a law and say, hey. So, so why the fixation on aviation this time around? I think they've identified that it is one of the fastest growing um, industries or, or things out there. Mm-hmm. The jobs that uh, kids can get with a two-year degree are, I mean, amazing. Um, so there are there's a huge shortage of these things, and the, as the bigger airports, especially you know, you look at where we are geographically, as these bigger airports charge more for uh, rents and things, they 
they're getting pushed out of these big airports. That they're just they're, they need space on regional airports. These schools, these uh, tech, uh, they, people to build planes, build mm-hmm. build engines, you know, things like that. You put an aid in the classrooms, K to three this year. Most shows at the K level, I mm-hmm. guess it was. Yep. Uh, as January rolls around and you get into another year of this, will there be a second aid provided for this upcoming term? Um, I'm gonna. I, I think we need to ensure that we've filled these positions. I, I think. I don't think. I don't think it's going to move as fast as we thought it would, but I, I know the intention will be there mm-hmm. to, to try and get whatever we can for that first three uh, grade levels. And that's, that's, I mean, that's what we committed to. And the discipline issues in the classroom. And I know a number of uh, people who are reintroducing discipline bills. I think the discipline bill we ran was extremely powerful. I just think the state BOE could have rolled that out with a little more um, – Enthusiasm? Yeah, just you know, more guidelines so that the, the the local BOEs didn't have to you know, create new rules. There should have been something rolled out mm-hmm. statewide saying, hey, these are the guidelines, in my opinion. What will the monitoring process be with these additional aids in the classroom to determine if they've been successful? I think in the end it's going to be test scores, right? That's the only thing that we have to really understand – what what we're doing and, and i think you've seen it in pre-k i think you'll see test scores come up in k and hopefully it starts just translating all the way through is the measuring process for the person who goes into kindergarten does that aid stay with them in first grade then go with them to second grade and then third grade and then we find out after third grade if it worked no i, I you know i don't know the specifics of exactly which aid stays with which child but i think you know it, the, the aid's going to be in kindergarten or in first grade should i say right now um, hopefully we get another aid for second grade, another aid for third grade. Um, and I think there should be rigorous testing processes all the way through so that we can monitor live. At this point, there is no hardcore definition of what's a successful increase. No, I, I don't. You know, if you, if you can have kids reading at the level they're supposed to be, then you're successful. Right. Some will, but not, Some will. So what, I'm but on, trying on, to get at what's a successful percentage of kids who are reading at grade level. I think of all the kids that are tested, I think, you know, seventy five percent should be reading it at, at uh, above above average. But there's nothing in the bill. There's nothing in the bill that right? says any of that. Do you guys intend to put something in the bill that determines what success is? You, you know, we didn't want to micromanage too much. I think you, you got to leave it up to the teachers and up to the local BOEs to decide. But when it comes to that test, we get the general average results, and mm-hmm. if the average results are all in the green, we're doing the right thing because right now they're all right. in the red. So if we can get them to the yellow, to then to the green, I think we're doing a good job. Right, but you guys are providing the funding, so ultimately you'll determine if the program's successful. Yes. Right? Yes. And it, it's one of those things where you, you can only provide the funding, give them the time to, and the resources to do their job, and then come back and, and decide, okay, three years, four years, five years down the line, mm-hmm. are we going to continue this or double down on this? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I- Just in my worldview, I have no statistics for this, but reading in particular, I think, is very home driven because, you know, either you're in a a home that reads or not. And for the amount of time in a classroom where reading skills can be taught, if they're not practiced in the home, then it's you're you're, it just isn't going to work. It's a three legged stool, right? Yeah, it's it's just as much the parents responsibility to get it getting them up there as well as the child as well as the teacher. So. Um, you, you you can't force parents to read to their kids at home. You can just encourage, and, and hopefully. Right, which gets to the point, though, if we're going to hold the school system's responsibility for reading in particular. I, th- mm-hmm. I think math is different. I think math is a very school-driven uh, skill. But to hold the schools responsible for reading scores, absent the consideration of, of the family involvement, there's it's kind of unfair. Right. And unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I'm excited. I've got a number of bills that came over on my desk. Uh, some are going to be very, very controversial. Like what? Uh, I got a raw milk bill. That well, that's always big. I thought that, that was already. I thought they no, so, so right now you can have herd shares. You can you buy a portion of a cow, and you have to get your milk delivered daily, weekly, whatever it is. Um, I can't walk into Matt Harvey's house and say, hey, Matt, can I buy a jug of milk from you as a friend or as a neighbor? Um, I just find that unbelievable. Well, it, I don't it, it, drink milk. I don't I, at all. I don't. <laughs> I don't think he meant specifically you, though, Matt. Well, 
good luck trying to buy milk from me because yeah i can't go to the for, farmer next door you and buy a pail cannot, of milk from him? You, you cannot go to the farmer next you have door to participate in some you sort have of, to participate in a herd share um he could give it to you though he could give it to you absolutely right. but how's that fair to the farmer you well, know, you sell. I could, I you could, sell. You uh, give me your your, your services. The too. farmer would sell like a handful of corn kernels, and you get a you gift a bottle of milk with it. No, like the, the way, way it works it. is you have to actually own a percentage of the cow, and you have to be delivered that milk every week or every day or whatever that percentage is. So you can't say, "Hey, I'm I need I've got enough milk." So why would that be controversial? Um. People the, hate the, it. The pasteurization yeah, I issue. Think people think it's dangerous, but I, I think if it's clearly labeled and if a consumer or if I want to go over to John Kilstrap's house and buy some milk, I should be able to do that. Um, well, it will have come from Food Lion, so, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> but, yeah, homogenized I, and pasteurized, yeah, vitamin D I, added. I have a neighbor that has a cow, and they, they have raw milk, and they make butter, and they do things like that. They should be able to to, to sell to their neighbors if, the, if it's clearly noted that, hey, this is raw milk. Just I don't so know how milk know. is, fu from a regulatory standpoint, how is it fundamentally different than eggs? You know, fresh out of the animal. Technically, you're not really supposed to be selling eggs either, but there's, there's a certain amount you can. There's a lot of rules in ag that, that it makes it really tough for small farmers. So huh. I, I have another bill that, that huh. lets uh, custom slaughterhouses sell um, a steak if they want. They don't have to sell a whole cow. Um, so a custom slaughterhouse can sell ground beef, steak, as long as it's clearly labeled and they're telling you what what they're doing you understand that you're buying a steak from mongs for instance i can only buy a quarter i have to own the cow in order to get him to process it it just doesn't seem right uh finally we'll wrap up this half hour yeah. some small business bills mike you had to try to get a couple of passed last yes. year and will there be a continuation there, of the reform of the abc laws yes definitely on the abc we're working we're working on that in uh the rules bundle we've got some things to help help out there uh my small business bill is actually has actually been taken up by the joint committee on eastern on uh economic development and they'll be running that as a committee bill both from the senate and the house and the bill states what and the bill just helps small business um with payroll tax credits for the first x amount of employees um they've changed it quite a bit but um it still has the same bones and i'm still i'm still sponsoring it. 